Okay, please rise. We'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Out of the night our spirit awakes at dawn unto you, O God, for your commandments are a light. Teach us your righteousness, your commandments, and your statutes, O God. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding, lest at any time we sleep unto death and sins. Dispel all darkness from our hearts. Graciously give unto us the Son of Righteousness, and by your Holy Spirit preserve our life unassailed. Guide our steps into the way of peace. Grant us to behold the dawn and the day with joy, that we may raise our morning prayers to you. For yours is the might, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Please be seated. Did everybody get a quote sheet? Yes? I think we all got it. All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. Today, is, this is our last uh, session for the ministry year. It's kind of hard to believe we've already gone through all of our, this is our eighth meeting of the year. And we're going to be wrapping up uh, with the, today with the Feast of Pentecost. Again, uh, just to be clear, um, we didn't cover all of the, of the great feasts. For example, we didn't do a talk about Lazarus Saturday. We didn't talk about Palm Sunday the Feast of the Holy Cross. Um, I specifically wanted to focus on the feasts that um, dealt directly with the life of Christ and had kind of the biggest impact in the divine economy, which is kind of, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, by no means was this an exhaustive uh, look into the feasts of the Lord, uh, just kind of an overview, something to inspire us to search uh, more deeply in our own hearts and in our own uh, minds about these feasts and God willing uh, through these wonderful feast days of our church uh, God will enlighten us and bring us closer to him and to his kingdom so today we're going to be talking about Pentecost which is celebrated every year 50 days after Pascha so it's a movable feast it's not there's no set date for Pentecost it's always um, basically seven weeks uh, after Pascha and uh, this year it happens to fall uh, next week, next Sunday. So it's a week from today is the Feast of Pentecost. And this is a quote from Joel 3.1. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so even in the Old Testament, we have this kind of foreshadowing, foretelling of uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I thought it was, pr it was nice to kind of start out with that idea of I will pour God pouring out his spirit on all creation. So the Feast of Pentecost, before we get into kind of our understanding and the, and the scriptural understanding, the New Testament scriptural understanding of Pentecost, I think it's important for us to understand um, that Pentecost actually was a feast in the ancient Jewish church before the Christian church came. Can everybody see? I know the lights are all on. Do you guys want me to turn the lights down or can we all see the way it is? We're good? Okay. So Pentecost was one of the, um, kind of the, I think one of the three most uh, important feast days of the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it was celebrated 50 days after Passover, so same idea. The word Pentecost is a Greek word assigned to this Jewish feast day, and we kind of took it on when we had our own Christian Pentecost in the New Testament. So in the Jewish church, the Feast of Pentecost was, the, uh, was a feast of the spring harvest, in the middle, I guess in the Middle East, I've never been there, but in the Middle East, the springtime is when the grain is harvested. And so this feast was when the first fruits of the grain harvest were, were gathered and they would be offered in the temple uh, to God. And so this is what this feast was. They also, during Pentecost, the Jews called to remembrance uh, Moses receiving the law um, from God on Mount Sinai. So the story of the Ten Commandments and how Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. 
So that's kind of a, where this feast is coming from and uh, gives us kind of a background of what's, what's going on in the, in the New Testament. So the Feast of Pentecost is really the founding of the church. It's the beginning of the Church of Christ, the Christian church. And this is a, a quote from John. I wanted to connect kind of this idea of the harvest feast to what Pentecost became for us in the New Testament with Christ. So this is an icon of Christ preaching the Sermon on the Mount, which we find in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And uh, Christ says, and this quote is from John, the Sermon on the Mount appears in different forms in all the Gospels. So he says, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And actually, now that I think about it, this quote comes from the story of the Samaritan woman. So the Samaritan woman leaves to go tell the village about Christ. And his disciples come back and he's talking and he says this. He says, look at the fields, they are ripe for harvest. And the interpreters of our scripture say that at that moment, that was the time when the people of the village were coming up to see who Christ was and they were all dressed in white. And so Christ says, look, the fields are white for harvest. Uh, so we have the foundation of the church in the Feast of Pentecost. So if the ancient Feast of Pentecost is the harvest, then the, it, is, it finds its fulfillment in our Feast of Pentecost, in the Christian Feast of Pentecost, with the founding of the church. Now, what I mean by that is the disciples, now that they have received the Spirit from on high, the church is founded, they are sent out basically into the fields to harvest new souls for the church. And so they begin immediately preaching the gospel and bringing people into the faith. Uh, for example, on the Feast of Pentecost in the, in the scriptures, in the book of Acts, because Acts is where we find Pentecost. Pentecost is not in the Gospels, so to speak. It's in the book of Acts, which is sometimes, sometimes referred to as the fifth gospel. Um, immediately after the disciples received the Spirit, uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit, they begin speaking in tongues. They begin speaking in languages that they previously could not speak. And these people were outside where they were, and they were hearing them speak and babbling, really, in these different languages. And they thought they were drunk. And so Peter uh, gets up and he addresses them, and he gives a speech that uh, the, the evangelist Luke, who wrote, who wrote Acts, says, cut, cuts them to the heart. And he, they ask Peter, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And so on that day, 3,000 people are baptized and enter the Christian church. And these are the first Christians that are baptized. So we have this instant harvest, you know, of, of, new, of new people entering the life of the church. But this was just the beginning. The number would continue to grow, 5,000 and beyond, as we know, uh, as the disciples went throughout the world and continued preaching. And now, uh, obviously, the, the Christian church is, is one of the largest world uh, religions. It is the largest world religion. Um, if you count all the Christian sects all together. So this is St. Nikolai Velimirovich. He has a nice little analogy. He says, when a seed is sown, when a seed is put in the ground, the power of warmth and light must come on it to make it grow. When a tree is planted, the power of wind must come on it to make it strong and establish it. When a householder builds a house, he seeks the power of prayer to consecrate his house. The Lord Jesus Christ sowed a most precious seed in the field of this world. And this seed is the seed of the gospel. You can think about the story of Christ talking about the sower, throwing the seeds throughout the world. And he says the seed, the, the seed that is being sowed is the gospel, the good news of Christ. So Christ now has planted this seed of the gospel in the world. The power of the Holy Spirit was needed to come on it, to give it warmth and light and make it grow. So it wasn't enough for us just to have Christ come and do everything and then disappear, ascend into heaven. Um, we needed the, the light and the warmth of the Holy Spirit to help the church to grow. And we see the effects of the Holy Spirit instantly in the story of Pentecost. Any questions so far? Let's continue talking about the church here. So before his ascension, Christ had commissioned his disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. This is the end of Matthew. He says, go forth and, pre and, uh, and, and spread the good news to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
He also told them to wait in the city until they were clothed with power from on high. So they kind of get two directions. It says, you will go out into the world and spread the gospel, but wait here until I send my power from on high, the power of the Holy Spirit. So on Pentecost, this is what happens. The Holy Spirit descends from heaven and alights on each of them in the form of tongues of fire. And they begin speaking in tongues, as we had said earlier. So this was the power given from God to preach to all people. Because they wouldn't just preach to people that spoke Aramaic. I mean, these, these, the disciples were mainly uneducated men. You know, they were fishermen from Galilee, which was a poor part of, of the Holy Lands at that time. They didn't know five, six languages to go and preach the gospel throughout the world. Uh, but the, yet they would go into Europe, they would go into Asia, they would go into Africa, and everywhere they went, they would spread the gospel. And they were able to do so because they had been given this gift from God to speak in tongues. Our mission as the modern church has not changed to spread the gospel to all, all people and to all nations. This is from Father Lev Gillet. It says, The language of the Spirit, at least in its inner meaning, is still accessible today to all men, to all races, to all nations. The language of the Spirit is still accessible today to all men, to all races, and to all nations. In other words, if a heart is open, no matter where this person lives and what language they speak, God will speak to them in the language of the Spirit and become accessible to them. An interesting comparison that some of the church fathers make with Pentecost is the story of the Tower of Babel. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this story, but in the Old Testament, uh, after God, after mankind falls away from paradise, there's a story of these uh, humanity gathering together and trying to build a tower uh, up to heaven, basically to storm, to storm heaven. So in this story, mankind uh, all spoke the same language and they were able to kind of cooperate against the will of God. And so what God did as they were building this as tower was they, he confused their tongues. He gave them all different languages so that they no longer could speak to one another. And so the building of this Tower of Babel um, kind of goes by the wayside. They're not able to complete it. And even the word Babel itself kind of has that connotation of them just kind of babbling at each other. I don't know if that's an intentional thing or if it's a nice coincidence for us, but you can imagine all these people, their language is being confused all of a sudden, not being able to communicate. Now in Pentecost, even though humanity still has different languages, he unites us again with the language, the common message of the gospel and the language of the Holy Spirit. And he's so now the disciples are able to go out and preach the gospel to all people. Now let's talk a little bit about what the Feast of Pentecost teaches us about the character of the church, of our, of our church, of Christ's church. Because we, we teach our people and we, and we believe that we are the, the same church that was founded on Pentecost. We are that continuation and we are that full expression of that church. So Pentecost it teaches us a couple things about the character of the church and what we're, how we're called to be as a church. First of all, the first condition is unity. The disciples are all gathered together and they're all, the, the book of Acts says, they're all in one accord. They're all in one spirit. They all are together. They're on the same page. They're unified. I think sometimes in our in our parish life, I think we struggle with that from time to time. Um, but this is kind of the condition for the coming of the Spirit and the fullness of the church. The second one is obedience. They obey Christ. They stay in Jerusalem despite the danger that they face there. Remember, this was not, a, this was not an easy time to be a disciple. Christ had just been um, crucified. There's rumors you know, going around that he's risen from the dead. Uh, and the Pharisees are trying to wipe this rumor out. They're trying to, to really blot out the name of Christ from the history books. And so the disciples, it says many times, especially in the resurrection stories, are, are hiding from the Jews out of fear of the Jewish authorities. But even so, they could have left Jerusalem. They could have gone somewhere else that was safer. But Christ told them, stay in the city. And so they are obedient. They obey the will of God and they, they let the will of God guide the church not their own wills and what's convenient for them. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is prayer. The Holy Spirit comes to them in a moment of prayer as they're praying together in unity and obedience to God. They pray and the Spirit descends upon them. 
So Father Lev again says, this was the church being born, this moment of Pentecost. The church being born. They all prayed together. We find in this the necessary conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit. At certain moments, we need to retire from the world and to shut ourselves in the upper room of our soul. There we must pray. And we must unite ourselves to the prayer and the faith of the whole church. So we have different elements here that Father Love is talking about. He's talking about an even further uh, kind of descent of the Spirit in our own hearts that takes place through the life of the church. And he says, and if we want to receive the Holy Spirit in our own lives, we have to be able to kind of withdraw and pray and live that life of prayer. And we also must uh, unite ourselves to the prayer and the faith of the whole church. So not to be individuals, so to speak, in prayer, but to be part of the whole life of the church in unity and obedience to God. Everything we need for a healthy church life is given to us from above, from, from God. At the, prayer, at the end of liturgy, there's a prayer that says that. All good things come from, uh, from God, from, from above, basically. In proper church life, God himself guides the community and the faithful that are, is within it. So uh, if we try to kind of force our own agendas and force our own ideas on the life of the church, the church won't work properly. There's going to be problems. But if we allow God to enlighten us and guide us and we accept and embrace his will, then we'll be healthy. We'll be, we'll be like the church on Pentecost. And we'll have that power and that same force that they had. This is from one of the hymns of Vespers. It says, The Holy Spirit provides every gift. He inspires prophecy, perfects the priesthood, grants wisdom to the illiterate, makes simple fishermen to become wise theologians, and establishes perfect order in the organization of the church. Wherefore, O Comforter, equal in nature and majesty with the Father and the Son, glory to you. So it's like, what, what else do we need besides the gifts of the Holy Spirit? So that's what we should seek first in our personal lives and in the life as a community as well. Seek the Holy Spirit. So really this feast that we're talking about is, is the feast of the coming of the Spirit into mankind. We've talked a lot about revelation in these lectures. We talked about, especially, I think about like Christmas and Epiphany, the revelation of the Logos, of the Word of God into the world, the light of God coming into the world again. So now the Feast of Pentecost is a revelation as well. It's a further revelation of the Godhead to mankind. It's, now it is not the Logos, it's not the Word of God that's being revealed, but it's the Spirit of God that's being revealed in its fullness to humanity. Not that we haven't seen the Spirit before, because we have. Epiphany, of course. Uh, when Christ is being baptized, the Spirit descends in the form of a dove upon a Christ. But now, the Spirit takes on a new role in the life of the church. The Spirit is going to be the one that is the leading force in the, in the new church that is being founded. This is the, John chapter 14. This is Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So if we love Christ, we will keep his commandments, and Christ will send down upon us the Holy Spirit, that he may live with us forever, that he may abide with us forever. The descent of the Spirit offers mankind a new relationship with God. Now what does that mean? We can think about the Holy Spirit, about God dwelling within us. And I have a nice, um, there's a nice quote here from Father Anthony that really helped me, uh, even after, I read this after seminary, helped me to kind of understand what the role of the Holy Spirit is in my own life. So the Trinity means that I believe in God the Father who made me, God the Son who saves me, God the Holy Spirit who lives in me, God the Father for us in love eternally, God the Son with us in grace historically but also eternally. God, the Holy Spirit, in us, in power, experientially, historically, and eternally. God, the Father, God above me. God, the Son, God beside me. God, the Holy Spirit, God within me and within the church. I think especially the, the, last, the last one, I, to me, was the most impactful. We think about God, the Father, up in heaven, looking down on us. God, the Son, who descended from heaven and walked with us. And we were able to journey with him. And he was, he was with us and next to us uh, as a brother and as a companion. 
And then we have God the Holy Spirit who is, literally will live inside of me uh, through the life of the church if I prepare myself and, and cleanse my soul and make it a, a suitable dwelling for the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of an amazing thing to think about that God wants to dwell inside of us. He wants to live in our souls. He wants to walk literally in our own hearts as we go through our lives. It's a very powerful thing. This is from Ezekiel. A new heart also will I give to you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will put my spirit within you. And so really this is the Holy Spirit, God within us, within our own hearts and souls. We are called to purify our hearts so that we may become a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, so that God may dwell within us. And this is really is the life of the church. The life of the church is one of transformation, purification. And then, if we, so if we embrace this life of the church, if we embrace this journey uh, that God has set us on, the Holy Spirit will come and will, uh, will dwell within us. And the church offers us many contact points, contact points with the Spirit, many points where we can come into contact with that same spirit that we want to dwell within us. And we see this especially in the sacraments. For example, the sacraments of baptism and chrismation. We pray, for example, in the baptism for the Holy Spirit to come down upon the water and sanctify it to make it holy. And then the, the sacrament of chrismation, which is the anointing with the holy oil, the chrism, um, that is blessed from, from the patriarchate. The sacrament of chrismation, we call it our own per personal Pentecost. When the child or the adult who's being baptized is anointed with the chrism, the priest or the bishop, whoever is serving the sacrament, says the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the chrismation is receiving the Holy Spirit in our lives. We also have the other sacraments as well, and especially the liturgy. In the liturgy, there's a portion which we talked about last year called the anaphora, the offering of the, divine, of the holy gifts to God to be transformed. And what happens is during the anaphora, during this prayer of offering, we also have a, a kind of like a sub-portion called the epiclesis. The epiclesis is the prayer in which we ask the Holy Spirit to descend and to transform the gifts. So during this part, we literally, the priest prays with the community for the Holy Spirit to come down upon us and upon the gifts that are presented. And so again, we have the Holy Spirit that is called down to be in our presence and to become part of our lives. And then we have the sacrament of confession. In the sacrament of confession, all the things that kind of muck up our souls, all the things that make our souls unsuitable for the Holy Spirit are taken away, are cleansed. And the Holy Spirit is able to come and dwell within us. So now we have this new relationship, and this relationship becomes a union with God and our own salvation. In my remarks after church, I talked about how Christ today said that salvation, eternal life, is to know God and to know Jesus Christ. Those things. Who is God's Son, sent into the world. And how do we know that? How do we come to know these God the Father and God the Son? We come to know Him through the Holy Spirit, who dwells among us and within us. So this becomes our own salvation, our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. St. Simeon, the new theologian, says, As a lamp, although it is full of oil and has a wick, remains dark until it is lit with fire, so the soul is quenched and dark until it is touched by the light and grace of the Holy Spirit. So imagine an oil lamp, as we see as we have on the altar table, full of oil, with a wick ready to go, but there's no fire to light it. The lamp will remain cold. It won't give any light. It can't. It has, nothing to, it has nothing to light the wick. For us, for us in our spiritual lives, that fire that lights our lamp, our, 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 the lamp of our souls, is the Holy Spirit. There's a story, there's a, a book in English called Father Arseny. And this is a story of a, a, an Orthodox priest who's in a Russian concentr concentration camp during communism. And in one of the scenes, uh, he's very close to death. He ends up surviving, but he's very close to death. And he has kind of this out-of-body experience. And he's journeying through the camp, and he's seeing all the different people, the guards, the prisoners. He's seeing all these different people within the camp. And he sees within each of them uh, the state of their souls. Some of them are completely dark, but others he sees as a, as a flame, as a, as a torch, as a fire. And he sees them burning very brightly, even though they're in this difficult situation. And so we can think of our own souls in that way. Where is the fire of our soul? Is our lamp lit? 
or is it cold because we haven't welcomed the Holy Spirit into our hearts? This is kind of, Pentecost should get us thinking about these things. Father Lev talks again about three stages of the spiritual life, which he says are comparable, comparable to three conversions. The first conversion is the meeting of the soul with our Lord, when he is followed as a friend and as a master. So the first conversion we'll undergo is we'll follow Christ as, as a friend and as a master. We'll follow him. The second conversion is a personal experience of forgiveness, of pardon and salvation, of the cross and of resurrection. So at some point in our lives, God willing, we'll have an experience, a personal experience of the forgiveness of God that Christ offers us through his cross and his resurrection. And this is kind of a second conversion that we have. Father Lev says the third conversion is the coming of the Holy Spirit into the soul like a flame and with power. It is by this conversion that man is established in a lasting union with God. So, God willing in our spiritual lives, as we go through, as we uh, not only follow Christ as our master and experience his forgiveness and his, his redemption through the resurrection, we'll also have this experience of the Holy Spirit who will come into us uh, with power and unify us with God. And he says Christmas or Epiphany and Easter and Pentecost correspond to these three conversions. So in the Christmas or Epiphany, we have kind of the first conversion. We, we see Christ and we follow him as our master. Then we have Pascha, in which we experience firsthand his own uh, forgiveness and our own salvation. And then we have finally Pentecost, which is the coming of the Spirit into our souls. Thirsting for the Spirit. The Gospel reading on Pentecost really has nothing to do with the feast itself. It's a Christ's, uh, Christ's dialogue, and as he's talking, he says to the people, uh, those who are thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So as Christians, part of our spiritual journey is this yearning for Christ, yearning for the Holy Spirit. We should be thirsty. We should feel like thirsty people who are looking for that Holy Spirit to quench our thirst. The events of Pentecost, in other words, have to play out in our own lives in order for them to be effective. And for that to happen, we have to yearn for it. We have to want it. We have to really be looking for it and thirsting for it in our lives. And so we're called to be thirsty for the Spirit. And again, here this scripture quote from John 7. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. And now John adds this part. Now this he said about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So if we were to kind of reread that and place the Spirit in there, it would say, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of the Holy Spirit. So if we thirst and come to Christ, come to the church with that thirst, seeking the Holy Spirit, we will be filled so much that the Spirit will flow out of us. O God, you are my God, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. This is the Psalms. This is David in the Old Testament talking about his experience of this yearning and thirst for God. Now, we have in the Feast of Pentecost the completion of the divine economy. Now what I'm talking about that when I say divine economy, God's plan to save us, God's plan of salvation. In the Feast of Pentecost, reaches its completion, reaches its culmination. There's a little diagram here I found. I thought it was kind of nice. God, you know, is incarnate. He is crucified. He's buried. He's a, he ascends. And then he dispenses the Spirit into our souls and bodies. So I thought that was kind of nice. So Christ, having completed the work that he came to do, he ascends. This is what we talked about last month. He ascends into heaven. So now the burden of the work of salvation shifts to the church that is left behind. Because really the life of the church is meant to be the life of Christ in his place, in his stead. Christ, he worked all these miracles, he taught the gospel, he, he, rose, he died and rose for us, he ascended into heaven. Our life as Christians in the church is to do the same things that he did. Okay? We're called to live out his life, to be his representatives and to live his life in the world now that he has ascended into heaven. God, the way I think about it sometimes is like, at that point, Christ is saying, okay, I've done my part. My role, my part is done. 
Now it's up to the church to accept the gospel in our own lives and spread the good news. But he doesn't leave us orphans. He doesn't just ascend into heaven and just leave us there. God sends us the Spirit so that we can have strength and power to carry out his mission in the world. St. John Chrysostom says, Consider the wisdom of Stephen. Now he's talking, this is kind of referring to that power that comes with the Holy Spirit. He says, Consider the wisdom of Stephen, the tongue of Peter, the vehemence of Paul, how nothing bore, nothing withstood them, not the anger of multitudes, not the rising up of the tyrants, not the plots of the devils, not daily deaths, but as rivers borne along with a great rushing sound, so they went on their way, hurrying all things with them. In other words, these men, these people, these saints, not just men, but the, 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 women, uh, men, the women saints as well, uh, and all the church, uh, they took on such power that they became like a, a river, a raging river that nothing could stop, you know, that nothing could get in its way. And we saw Christianity just explode, especially once we get into like the time of, of Constantine and, and the Byzantine Empire. We see Christianity really explode at that time. Um, but even in those early years, through persecutions, through um, just so many difficult things that the church went through, Nothing was able to stop them. And the same thing goes for us if we embrace this same life. So we can think about this story of salvation, this nice icon on, on the left here, um, of all the different feasts. Uh, I think starting even with the life of the Virgin Mary as well. So we have all the feasts of the church on the, on the left. Think about salvation being a transition from winter to spring. And now there's a kind of a lengthy quote you guys have from St. Nikolai Velimirovich, but um, we'll go through it kind of piece by piece. So it says, for a better understanding, this comparison may help you. It said, the sun shines in winter and in spring, but its light and warmth cannot make anything grow through the snow in winter. So the sun, God, basically shines on us no matter what, right? Um, in spring, though, the same sun that has the same warmth and light makes all the sown seeds sprout and grow. So for some reason, in winter, it's cold and nothing grows. And in spring, it warms up and everything grows. Scientists tell us, remember, this is a, this is a bishop of the church that's talking now, a saint of our church. Scientists tell us that the part of the earth where there is winter moves away from the sun, that the snowy regions are standing further from the sun, and that they receive the sun's light in an, at an angle, not as direct rays. In spring, that part of the earth turns toward the sun. The snowy regions come closer to the sun, and the sun's light and warmth come as direct rays. We're we all on the same page so far? In the winter, the earth kind of tilts away, and we don't get the sun directly. We get it at an angle, and we're farther away. We get less sunlight. So he's saying that's why it's cold in the winter, and in the spring it's warm. He says, continues, From Adam to Christ... Men's souls were like the earth in winter, far away and at an angle, no direct contact. The Holy Spirit gave light and warmth, but because of the sinful twistedness of man's souls and its separateness from God, it remained frozen, and no sort of fruit was able to sprout and grow from it. So Saint Bishop Nicholas painting a picture of humanity between Adam and Christ before the coming of Christ. Basically, there was no direct contact with God, and so humanity remained in this kind of frozen and dead state. The Lord Jesus redirected the soul of man and brought it close to God, cleaned the ice and snow off of it, plowed it, and sowed divine seed in it. And the Holy Spirit began then, like the sun in springtime, to bring forth and show by his power sweet and wonderful fruits in the field of the human soul. So now that Christ has done the work of redirecting us, of placing us in the direct sunlight of the spring. Now that sun of the Holy Spirit, that warmth and that light from the Holy Spirit, is able to take effect, is able to really become um, powerful in bringing forth fruits in the human soul. So this is how we can think about this journey that we've been on from, from the Annunciation, from the, from the announcement of Christ's coming into the world, to now we're talking about Pentecost. We're talking about you know, 33 years in the life of Christ. We're talking about um, really the whole story of salvation from the beginning of time until today. It is nothing is kind of painted really well in this picture of now we have this opportunity where in the church we're in the direct sunlight. And it's kind of up to us to allow that Holy Spirit to, 
to take part of our lives, to be part of us, and to um, have that warmth and that light bring forth fruit for the glory of God. Okay, any questions? Pentecost or any of the feasts that we've talked about? Anything? No? All right, thank you very much. God bless all of you. Uh, God willing, we'll be able to continue this in the fall. We'll have a new topic. And um, thank you for being with us all these months. And, and may God bless you all. Thank you. Την πρεσβείε ακίμη των Θεοτόκων και προστασίε αμετάθετων ελπίδων. Τα φω και νεκρόση φου και κράτησαν ω γαρζόη μητέρα. Προς την ζωή μετέστησεν ο μητρανικής σαν.